Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Phoenix, Arizona, it's time for Phoenix Business Radio, spotlighting the city's best businesses and the people who lead them. Welcome, everyone, to Project Management Office Hours, the number one live project management radio show in the U.S., broadcasting to you from the Phoenix Business Radio X studios in Tempe, Arizona. And I'm actually in the studio for the first time since the pandemic hit. So hopefully everybody out there has been safe, their families have been well, and I'm glad that we can get back to somewhat of a normal routine. I'm your host, PMO Joe, Joe Puzz, and for the next hour, we're going to be talking project management and the PMP with our distinguished guests. I also want to, of course, uh, thank our sponsor, the PMO Squad, which is home of the Purpose Driven PMO. Visit www.thepmosquad.com to learn how the squad can support your project management team with veteran PM resources, project management training, and of course, PMO builds and recovery. And a reminder for everyone to visit projectmanagementofficehours.com to see upcoming uh, information on upcoming episodes, listen to all of our previous episodes, and also see what amazing guests we have coming up. And speaking of guests, super excited to have with me today, Lee Lambert and Sierra Hampton-Simmons. Welcome, both of you. Glad to be here, Joe. Thanks. Sierra, why don't we uh, give you an opportunity to say hello to our listeners and share a little bit about yourself. Sure, thanks. Hi, everyone. My name is Sierra Hampton-Simmons, and I'm currently the Director of Certification Products for PMI. I have been at PMI for the last seven years. I'm working on all things PMI certification, including the best exam, PMP. I have a long career in certification, though. I came from IT certification, formerly at Cisco Systems and Citrix Systems, and now at PMI. Nice to meet everybody. Thank you so much. And Lee, i give you a moment to say hello to everybody. Yeah, it won't take me too long. I uh, just got into this business uh, about 53 <laughs> years ago, and uh, and I loved every minute of it. And the highlight of my career is what we're going to be talking about today is this whole PMP thing, and Sierra's kind of shepherding that to its new uh, height. And we're looking forward to the progress that we're going to make in the, in the coming years on that program. Well, thank you both for joining us. And Lee, I believe you're coming from Columbus, Ohio. You're joining us. Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. And as a, uh, I'm a University of Michigan Go Blue fan. So please <laughs> go easy on me. I know the Buckeyes have been beating up the Wolverines the past few years. So please take yeah, it easy if, on me. If I'd have known that, I probably wouldn't be here today. So. <laughs> well, good thing we kept that under wraps. Then. <laughs> So let's, uh, it, today's the PMP, right? How amazing a show is this going to be? We, we've we got Lee, obviously one of the founders of the PMP, all the way to Sierra now, who's a, responsible for that at PMI. So let's take a journey, right? Let's Let's go back to the beginning. Lee, share with us how it all started, right? What, where did the PME, PMP come from and how were you involved? I'll give you what I recall as I get older, sometimes that changes, but <laughs> I'll try to do my best. Uh, in, in 1981, uh, it was decided that the PMI organization wanted to institute a certification program. Now, at the time, and a lot of people don't know this, but at the time, the, the primary objective was to give someone a reason to join PMI because our membership was sort of flattened out in 81. Uh, and so they wanted to get something that would bring people into the organization. And they did some talking around to some of the other uh, engineering organizations where the certifications expanded their membership. So that was a tack. Now, it took three years to get to where we could actually execute that. Quite a committee. There was a guy named Dean uh, Martin that was a professor at Western Carolina University who was chosen to sort of head that program up. And under his uh, tutelage, uh, up until, unfortunately, he passed away unexpectedly, uh, we created the program and rolled it out in the, in the Philadelphia Symposium in 1984. Forty-three people passed and became the first PMPs uh, in, the, in the history of the organization. And in the coming years, it took off slowly, to be honest with you. In 10 years' time, we had a total of 6,000 members. Uh, that had PMP certification. That's not very many. That's not what you call a fast growth rate. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we looked at that and thought, well, why why is that? And and Davidson Frame uh, 
said, you know what we need to do is to open this to anyone who wants to be involved in project management, not just those people who joined PMI. So we made that decision and sort of the rest is history. Uh, linking up with uh, IBM and Motorola and AT&T and Sprint, that didn't hurt either when they adopted <laughs> it as their, their certification methodology. But uh, over, the ne- over the next years, it went from 6,000 to, gosh, only knows, uh, we're over a million now. And uh, probably Sarah knows the actual number, but it's well over a million by this time. And, and it's, it's morphed, though, and that's the important part that I think has really happened is it's changed from, from uh, a certification that says you understand project management, you know how to uh, study the PMBOK and you, you can answer some questions, to a real reflection of your skills in terms of managing projects. Actually, not just taking exams where we got killed with a bunch of uh, MBAs who decided they'd like to be PMPs, and so they studied and took the test and passed, but real people who do real project management, and it's caught on to a significant extent. Our our biggest uh, audience right now is, I think, probably India, uh, South Korea, China, if we can get all our relations worked out there. So it's it's worldwide. It's international, and I can't say uh, I could, there's anything I could be more proud of to say that I took part in the start of that. Yeah, what an amazing piece of history, right? Uh, Sierra, what is the count? Where are we at today? To give you an exact number, I would be telling you a myth because it changes overnight. Um, but let's say he was right when he said it's well over 1 million. I think it's like one point, nearing 1.1 right now, million people worldwide and growing every day. Yeah, and, and yeah. I make I make it a point uh, because I'm a, I'm a LinkedIn freak. I make it a point to congratulate everybody as they post their their achievement with the PMP. And I'll tell you, I mean, some days that's all I get to do is give <laughs> congratulations to PMP people. They're they're coming in in big numbers, so their attention is definitely there. Well, you met, so this is back in '84, right? Um, yep. And so that's about 36 years ago, of course. The business world has changed since then, right? Is, is Does the PMP try to align with the change environment that we see in the business world? Is that why uh, it's altered from what it used to be? Absolutely. So we have been doing studies every three to five years about that time. We look at how the market's changing, the job market. And we interview not only stakeholders um, who are in the profession, but we also talk to organizations that they work for to understand what types of projects they're doing, what methodologies they're using, the whole nine. And the whole point of that is to make sure that we're staying true to to the profession. Um, We don't want to just talk about academic practices. We want to talk about real world practices on the job that people can find universal truth to. It's something that um, to Lee's point, that's done in China, Korea, North America, Europe. Um, they have to have that kind of commonality through the, through the research that we do. We make sure that we're finding things that's common among all those geos and industries. And the other thing that I think happened with PMI, and I don't know if this is considered uh, just when, when Sunil joined as the new CEO, but, but we've embraced this idea of a project economy. So it's it's bigger than a project. And Paul Dinsmore, who's a PMI fellow who lives in Rio, he wrote a book in the 80s uh, that was called Managing Organizations by Project. And unfortunately, he was way ahead of his time. The, we weren't, the, the world wasn't ready for that because basically what he and I have always agreed on is everything's a project. And if you're going to have a corporation that works on an integrated basis, project management is key. We saw what Gerstner did with IBM when he turned it around using project management as the thread that held the organization together. So I think we're starting to see the evolution to where people are realizing, hey, this is bigger than just a project. You know, there's obviously lots of chatter, pro and con that you get on social media platforms about anything, and the PMP is no exception. Um, Lee, you had alluded it uh, to it a little bit earlier about anybody Uh, can study and pass the PMP, and that doesn't make you a project manager, right? Why the designation of 
PMP, right? Project Management Professional. Why why did you come up with that? Why, why is that the title and not a PPM, for instance? Do you want me to take a shot at that, Sierra? Yes, please. Okay, because uh, it was my idea. Uh, we were. <laughs> you should you should take it then, Lee. <laughs> yeah, we were in meetings in uh, Western uh, Cullow in the in the hills of North Carolina, and one of the things we met with, and this was a couple of presidents and some other folks that have been actively involved, was what are we going to call this thing? And the bulk of the committee wanted to call it Professional Project Manager (PPM). Okay. I looked at it in a different way. Uh, I said, you know, there's going to be a lot of people in the world of project management that may never be the project manager because it's a team concept. Everybody on the team ought to understand the concepts, understand how project management works. So I suggested maybe we broaden it to say it's a project management professional indicating you know the business, you know the terminology, you may never be the project manager, but you're still quote qualified. Okay. So, and that, that, that went well for a long time. And then as we entered the international marketplace, the certifications have a little different meaning over there. And so they thought it meant that you were a seasoned veteran project manager, that you had run big projects effectively. Uh, and, and so they began to say, now, wait a minute, I just met a guy that had his PMP that, you know, couldn't manage his way out of a paper bag. Well, that's it's not what he does. He provides financial support. He provides quality support. Uh, but they didn't see it that way. So we see a lot of the pressure. Most of the negativity comes from misunderstanding what the intent was. But I think because we've stiffened up the qualifications to take the exam, back back in the early days, I was the certification qualification committee. Uh, <laughs> I reviewed every single application and, and it wasn't that hard. I mean, you, basically you look for a pulse. Uh, <laughs> and and my, my view was always if if you can if you can qualify to sit for the exam, the exam will screen out those that really aren't qualified. And that's always been my position. But PMI's, uh, I think, up, up the ante a little bit by making it substantially more difficult to qualify to take that exam. You really do have to show proof of managing tasks or activities for periods of time, 4,500 hours. Uh, and so I think somehow we'll start to screen that off. But you still you still have some people, uh, to be honest with you, I think they're jealous because it's been so successful. And I think they're going like, why in the heck didn't I think of that? You know, in an email earlier today, Lee, you had shared me that you just uh, are about to renew your, your – um, certification here because you've got your PDUs in. And I'm wondering, those original 43 members who passed that PMP originally, shouldn't they be like grandfathered in for life? You're just an automatic member. No need to recertify, right? You're just, you're in. It's like the, the Amer- Amex black card, right? You've got whatever you want. Well, there's a, there's a story that goes with that. I'll tell you, uh, all of us on the committee shared your opinion. Uh, we <laughs> felt like we should be grandfathered in. Uh, but unfortunately, PMI uh, said, uh, no, 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 that's not the way it's going to work. Uh, you have to pass the exam, save as everyone else. And oh, by the way, we're going to exclude you from taking the exam for 10 years. 10 oh. years. And oh. so uh, people were going like, 10 years? I got to wait. So uh, we waited our 10 years. On the on the day of the 10th year passed, I got a little email. I guess it might have been a letter back then that said, uh, you can take the test now. Now, you want to talk about pressure? You want to talk about <laughs> You better pressure? pass it, Lee. Yeah, that's exactly right. You better pass that darn thing. So I studied like crazy and uh, and passed it with a group of AT&T people in Altamont Springs. But uh, it, uh, it it wasn't – it was back when it was the eight body of knowledge areas, paper test, took all day. Uh, I, I finished the whole exam in three hours, passed, got 100%. And so – well, I didn't really – we don't tell people what they actually did, but I tell people that. <laughs> Uh, and so I, I uh, every three years that rotates around, I get a letter saying, you, you know, you need to renew. And two two cycles ago, I just ignored it. <laughs> you know, I ignored it. They sent me another one. Said, well, you think we're kidding? You, you need to renew. <laughs> and in fact, they, in fact, they said, in fact, you've passed the deadline. You, we're withdrawing your PMP. I called them up and I said, do you know who the heck you're talking to? <laughs> 
And I said, yeah, we do. And your damn pig's been suspended. <laughs> so I had to get the PDUs and get back online. It, they don't they don't treat anybody with any favoritism, I guarantee you. Yeah. Well, at least you get to get yours. Uh, since I've been working at um, PMI, I didn't get my PMC before, and I was like, oh, maybe I'll go for it. The rules have changed in such a way that I can never be eligible because I've been exposed to all the questions yeah. and how they work. So yeah. at least you that get to have it. You get to yeah, have it. Makes sense. You probably would get 100%, <laughs> wouldn't you? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. So, Sierra, how is how has the PMP changed over the years, right? I mean, Lee gave us a little bit of a history lesson of, of how it started. Um, and as the business environment changes, we're now in the project economy. What, what, is, mm-hmm. what does the PMP look like now? That's a good question. I was uh, showing up on the video. This is the only copy I could find a PMP test that's similar to the original one that was designed by Lee. This was from 1994. Um, and um, back then, it, to his point, for every domain of the test, it was a paper and pen, um, pen test, and you had to fill it out. And um, uh, it was eight sections, and it was rather long from what I can tell because the timing that's put here for the test um, is quite in, intense um, in, in terms of taking all day. It seems like it was an eight-hour test. Oh, wow. Um, there are um, so, 30 questions on each domain area. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So that was the original test. Um, when I look at the actual test questions, they look a lot like the test questions you'll see on the current PMP, which means from the very start, it had a quality writing to it. It was very well written. So that's one thing that I can see that's different. But other things that are different is um, to point is um, this version of the test, while it's very, the questions are very well written, some of them are what we call the kind of types of questions you can tell the person about the pen box. A lot of those kind of questions are here. Um, whereas in the new PMP, you'll see more scenarios where, um, yeah, we hope that you read the pen box, but on, in addition to that, you have to have a little bit of experience. Um, it's nuanced in that way. Like if you've done the role of project management for your team, you will pick up on the answer a lot easier than if you hadn't. There's less computational ones, straight computational questions. Um, but The new PMP now is on a computer, mostly. Um, I think the only reason where we deliver it on paper is uh, is in China still. Um, But the rest of the world gets the test on a computer. Um, We also have introduced different types of questions. So we have the scenarios. Um, We also have digital ones where you can drag and drop things. You can do computational things. Um, We also have um, new animations that are being introduced any day now. Um, so when the new exam comes out, they'll see a lot more of that. And that's just responding to the way people have changed over the years, right? We all use computers now, and we're so accustomed to touching things and having them move. And that changes the way people think and how they process things. So we had to change the types of questions to really get the best kind of um, responses out of the candidates for the test. We find that they do better when we vary up the types of questions because in their life, they're dealing, dealing with digital stuff all the time. Another thing that I'm interested in, right, as you're talking through that, it made me think of there. We didn't have a CAPM back in '84, right, Lee? And we didn't. You know, there there wasn't the program management certification, the Agile certifications. So it was a one size fits all back there for any certification that you wanted for project management. It was the only one that existed for an awfully long time. I think the the next one to come online was RISP, perhaps. I, I don't remember for exactly. Uh-huh. Uh, but then, of course, they've kind of grow because you see this specialization becomes a big issue. And so the idea that I can get specialized in, in scheduling a RISP or Agile, that's very important if that's the environment that you work in on a regular basis. So I think uh-huh. it's a very wise move to do that. Yep. Yeah, but with the CAPM, a lot of the stuff, um, some of the questions about the book and what have you um, have gone in that direction. And it's really, truly helping those people who maybe have never, ever worked on a project team. You know, they know about projects, but they haven't worked on a project team and they know projects are important to their business. So they want to demonstrate, hey, pick me when you need to create your next project team. Give me an opportunity. Let me put my foot in the door. And so that's a, a different type of test. 
You know, Lee, you had mentioned uh, specialization. A, a question for you, Sierra, would be uh, veterans and project management is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I'm co-founder of a 501c3 nonprofit called VPMMA, the Veteran mm-hmm. Project Manager Mentoring Alliance, where we yeah. help veterans and spouses uh, in their project management careers. And, right. and I had a question uh, come in to me earlier today on LinkedIn uh, asking about that of, how, you know, the, the language and the culture within the military of project management is different than corporate America. So the language on the test is a little more challenging for a veteran because they don't speak that language. What What's out there for veterans and, and military spouses to be able to get some assistance, not to make the test easier for them, right, but to help them prepare for it properly? Yeah. I'm really happy to talk about that. Um, last year, we launched a program with our partner, Pearson View, that's targeted towards um, those men and women who are either active duty in the military or veterans. Um, and it's, it's really geared towards getting, helping them find a career in the civilian world that really maps to the things that they've done in the military. So we've created micro websites, which actually helps them translate the language that they they use in service to the language that you would use in corporate settings. And um, that is one thing we're doing. And we're also showing them how they can use their military benefits to help pay for the certification. And last year, we actually started testing on base, um, as well as front lines on submarines at various embassies across the globe for um, U.S. Um, federal employees and um, enlisted men and women and their, um, their uh, dependents. So we do a lot to try to bridge that gap. Um, and that campaign so far is doing really well. We've had, um, since we launched it, every quarter we're doing about 400 people who are participating in that program, which is really much more than we had been doing before with this audience because we recognize that that is indeed a need. We have to talk to them in a language they understand and demonstrate to them that, to your point, everything is a project. So if you've been leading a squadron, you've been doing a lot of things that project managers have to do. And how can we help you translate those skills into a very lucrative civilian career? Yeah, I think the good news on that is that the training they receive in the military is consistent with the ideas behind project management. And in fact, I'll tell you, because I'm so old, I saw it happen. Uh, A lot of the things that we do in project management, the tools and the concepts are directly coming from the Department of Defense in the U.S. military environment. So the transition is more of a terminology and understanding environment as it is the basic learning that they have to do. Yeah, I'm. uh, Lee and I were chatting earlier about some of the talks we're doing for PMI chapters here during the pandemic. I've got one coming up here in the Phoenix chapter, and least where I talked to Phoenix, but mine's on empowering people to deliver results. And one of the uh, pieces that I reference in there is the ADP-1 from the Army, where it talks about mission command and how uh, the military, right, empowers their subordinates to act as necessary during individual events. And I mean, you could take out mission command and and put in project terms. There's so many different uh, connections there with the military. So it's great to see PMI supporting the veterans the way they are. Uh, but I'm going to segue that into maybe a little bit of a different or, or more difficult question, right? One of my good friends is Doc Eric Wright, who runs an organization called Vets to PM, which, which helps veterans become project managers through PMP training. Uh, and he's a registered education provider, right? So a lot of chatter out there that the REPs are getting impacted by some of the recent decisions uh, that we've had on how to help prepare for the PMP. And and I know as a representative for PMI, I want to give you a chance, Sierra, to be able to talk to them to get it straight from the person who's running these programs, why they, we made those changes and, and what's the benefit in it for them. Sure. So, yes, we did announce some changes to our training provider program. Um, it was the registered education provider. I think the new name is the um, authorized training provider. Um, but those, those changes that have been recommended were really about customers, about students and candidates for the test. Um, while there are tremendously good REPs out there, there's tons of them, right? Um, there are some who struggle to keep up with um, keeping the curriculum up to date. 
And then there are some who struggle because maybe they don't teach project management all the time, right? Maybe that's just one of 10 different things they teach and um, they may not have a subject matter expertise. And as a result, sometimes we'll hear things from our candidates, from our customers saying, hey, I went to the training and it didn't adequately prepare me or, you know, um, they prepared, they, they made me think the exam was going to be way different than it was. And, and to them, that's all coming from PMI. So we made a decision to really help standardize that experience for our customers and also help out those people out there who are delivering training for us because um, I, I know we'll talk about this probably a little bit as well. We've changed the exam, the exam significantly um, by introducing Agile and other things into it. And we realize that, especially for the smaller REPs, the burden of updating their training materials is going to be too much. And we didn't want to squeeze them out. We wanted to be able to support them while simultaneously assuring that our customers had quality content. So some of the changes, I mean, I don't manage that program, but I can say some of the changes are directly, you know, making sure they have standard authorized training materials, that their trainers have received great training and learned the concepts that are covered in the test, um, that they don't have to go and do self-service and figure it out on their own. They're getting trained by someone who's authorized from PMI, the trainers themselves, before they're actually training an end customer. And also empowering these um, organizations, these schools, to be able to have access to leads and other things to make their business a healthy one. Um, and we do, we're doing all this ultimately to help the end customer, the student, and the potential candidate for our exam. Yeah, let me can I let me say something about that too because I I uh, I kind of watch these changes uh, closely just to be sure I can communicate with people when they ask me what the heck's going on. This ATP thing has really gotten a lot of attention, uh, and and I've gotten a lot of uh, questions about it. But here's where I'm coming from on it. When, it, when I heard it was coming about, uh, I was a little reluctant to just embrace it out of hand. But then as I got to realize what was going on, I don't know if it was Deming or what what quality guy said it, but quality isn't free. Uh, and what I saw this was a chance to really deliver quality training to people. Uh, because I, I've seen, uh, I'm going to call them schlock operations that are in it to make the money, okay? And I saw some that were teaching uh, the third edition was being taught for this test. Because wow. they just, yeah, they, they, they just wanted to get the money. They wanted to get the revenue. So mm -hmm. I saw this as a way for quality control by PMI. If they're going to deliver the materials and they're going to consistently be the same for everybody, that should increase the quality of the education that a student is going to get. So I, I had an opportunity to participate a little in the train the trainer development. And, and I'm telling you, they're, they're moving in the right direction. People just need to realize that. We can't, you can't just let anybody teach this information if they're not properly qualified. And I think this has gone a long way uh, to solidifying quality delivery by our ATPs. Well, certainly, I think we want to protect and not dilute the the branding that PMP carries, right? I mean, that's the Absolutely. most important thing we've, for those of us who've earned it, it means something, right? I, I'm a PMP and dang it, I've earned that, Um and I want to make sure that everybody else that carries that same designation uh, is getting the proper training and, and can pass, not just pass the test, right? Passing a test doesn't mean anything. Being able to practice and be a practitioner to me matters. And the heck, I ran a lot of PMO departments where I interviewed a lot of PMPs and I knew that uh, they weren't practitioners, right? They were just test passers. And sure. there's a big difference there. You mentioned, uh, Sierra, a little bit about the test and, and the makeup of it. What what is the test? How how does it look today? How is it framed? How much of it is agile? I know that's part of it now. Or, and give us kind of a breakdown. Okay. Um, well, currently the test is still broken down into domains, the, the test that you could take today, into test sections that are very much so aligned to the PMBOK guide. So the whole process flow from initiating to closing out a project, if you will. However, um, we started some research and redesigned the exam last year. And um, while we postponed it because of the pandemic, we will be releasing a new version of the PMP in January of 2021. 
And that um, version of the text is uh, going to be structured quite differently from the PMBOK. Um, first of all, where the exam is going from, I would say, 95% predictive project management and with 5% agile to 50% pr predictive and the other 50%, a combination of agile and hybrid methodology. Um, and that came out of a lot of research that we've been doing for years, actually. It wasn't some last minute research we did um, in 2018 or 2019. For the years, for years, we've been watching this trend where more and more practitioners, people who are actually practicing in the profession of project management and the organizations they were working for were telling us, hey, yeah, we still do predictive. It's king. However, we have needs for agile and hybrid approaches. And when we do have those needs, it's important that the folks who are working on those projects are familiar enough that they can steer the ship in the right direction, if you will. Um, so that's one major change. The other change that we made is, um, as I alluded to before, was the actual sections. So before um, the domains or the sections of the test, as I said, were aligned to the, the process of project management, a predictive process, more or less. The redesign of the new exam is really dispersed upon three domains. And one is its people, like how do you deal with people in a project, essential. And that's the biggest, one of the bigger sections of the test is 42%. And then there's the process section, which is where you would find the stuff you typically would have found in the PMP. Um, so everything from predictive processes to agile methodologies and the mix, the hybrid blend. Um, and then there is a new section called business environment. Um, and that's where you deal with things like compliance, um, regulatory standards and things like that, because that's, um, we were told um, by all of the project managers who we participated in our focus groups and our surveys that, you know, they could be the best project manager in the world, but if they're not aware of the business <coughs> environment, that could totally tank the success of that project. So those are the main changes from a structure perspective. Um, and again, it's back to what I said before. It's aligned to how we've seen organizations um, philosophy and approaches towards project management change. Um, but no, yeah, so that's coming in January. So for uh, can I ask you something, Sarah? Uh, do we will we still see the talent triangle in the future, or is that being replaced by these three domains? No, it is not. The talent okay. triangle is really about how to develop yourself over time to make sure that you're still valuable to an entity. So we're still going to focus on strategic thinking, technical skills, et cetera, right? So we're okay. still doing that in your recertification. It's just in the test itself. Those are the, how we structure the content. We think about it, you know, if we had kept the old structure, which was mostly aligned to a predictive methodology, how would we find a way to write agile questions and hybrid questions? It makes it really difficult. So we had to kind of break that mold to be able to fit all the content. Um, when we moved to the Pembuck Guide 6 edition, and that includes Agile, people kept looking to us to say, well, where, why don't you have more Agile on the test? Well, we found it quite incredibly difficult to write questions aligned to that old structure. Um, so this gave us, you know, this new design allows us to be more flexible with that and allow us to really address all of those methodologies. I'll play a little devil's advocate on that and just say, so we still have the Agile certification, though. So, Absolutely. So does the Agile certification ask traditional questions? And why Not are, at all. Yeah. So, the, so I'm just, how do I know which course or path to follow if I'm going to, or should I just get both certifications, I guess, and cover both of them, right? Um, you can get both of them, but typically what we've seen, um, the other <laughs> certification, I guess you're referring to the PMI ACP, the Agile right. Certified yeah. Practitioner. That's really intended for someone who's a practitioner of Agile, and it's, it's, dem it's demonstrate your broad understanding of Agile on the workplace. The Agile that we have in the PNP is just um, acknowledging that you understand these Agile approaches. So when you're handed this project that is going to use a different methodology, it's not foreign to you. So it's, it's, it's a little bit different, um, and it's not as broad as the ACP. Um, the PMP is intended to show that you lead and direct projects, all kinds of projects, whereas the ACP is intended to show that you can um, do well on an agile team. You're not necessarily a scrum master. You're not leading a project. You're just on the team. 
So they're for different audiences. That's a good clarification. And uh, another question kind of related to that as well. Somebody like Lee or myself that passed the PMP many years ago, mm-hmm. it's a different flavor, right? It's a different PMP than that's going to be next year. How do we, you know, we're recertifying, we're renewing uh, every three years, but it, we're, we're not necessarily being tested on these new expectations for new PMP people who pass, right? So how do we differentiate from a PMP back in when Lee got it or when I got it compared to a PMP that's getting it in the future? That's a good question. Um, so right now, any new PMP, when they get awarded their credential, in addition to their certificate, they get a digital badge. And that digital badge is not just something you put on your LinkedIn profile. When you click inside of it, it tells you what that person was certified in. So for Lee, it's going to say he was certified in the eight domains that he was certified in. For someone in February of next year, it'll highlight the Agile and Hybrid um, portion. So that's how you'll tell the difference. To follow up on that, if you're someone like yourself and that was all you were certified in, but you over time uh, collected information and you, you still are knowledgeable about Agile and Hybrid as well, and you want to demonstrate that, we are going to be offering a badge program where you could take a micro certification and take a small, short, short test on Agile and hybrid methodologies. And that earns you PDUs, but it also gives you a badge to say, even though my PMP, when I took it, was on this, I over time have collected this information too. And therefore, I know exactly what the other person knows. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I think it's all going to me, it's all about value, right? I mean, we're, okay. we're getting these for a purpose. And, and Lee, looking at somebody that has traveled this PMP journey from beginning to now and into the future, what value do you think for somebody who's considering the PMP, can you share with them why they should get it, right? What's the value in this for them? Well, there's a couple of things. I I think we can't overemphasize the importance of the credential itself. I think the credential uh, validates your knowledge level and I think the credential may open the doors to opportunities, but beyond that, it's going to be individual performance that's going to make the difference of the value being delivered. So I, I think we've we've put sometimes too much emphasis on, hey, I, I got to get the PMP. Well, that's true, but I've known a lot of people with the PMP that they're not project managers. They, they haven't capitalized on it. They haven't uh, taken it to the next level. So you got to look at what do you want to accomplish as a as an outcome of getting your certification, whichever category it's in. And then you've got to go to work with that. I my daughter, the the attorney, she she uh, she uh, went to Pepperdine University out in Malibu. It was a tough gig, but somebody yeah, nice had campus, to, huh? Said. Yeah, yeah. She she <laughs> yeah. said somebody had to. Uh, so when she graduated. Uh, she, uh, she was. I thought she'd come back to Ohio, but she said, "No, I'm going to stay in California." And I said, "What are you going to do?" And she said, "I'm going to get a job with a four, with a big five consulting company." And I said, "You are?" She said, "Yeah." I said, "Well, what do you have to offer? You've never worked a day in your life." She said, "Yeah, but I have my law degree from Pepperdine." <laughs> Right. Said, well, <laughs> okay. Okay. So we, we, uh, we, I, I called some of my friends down there and, and I arranged for her to go in and talk to them. And I warned her going in. I said, look, you, you know, you'll have a nice interview, but you're not going to get a job out of this. Well, I didn't realize that I had taught her well on the people skills side. So she ended up getting a job. And when she did, I, I said, well, just remember you're in the door. Now that law degree won't matter really that much. It'll depend on what you do with it. And I think ultimately, at the end of the day, that's what we have to realize. The, the certificate is a door opener. It's a, it's a provider of an opportunity to capitalize on your knowledge. Yeah, I love that uh, description. And, and again, having interviewed a lot of people, there's a very clear difference. And you can tell, right, very quickly within the interview who carries the certificate and who practices the what the certificate means. Yeah, it doesn't take long. Yeah. Lee, I guess another question for you is, you know, you started this way back in 84. So d- did you think back then about the future and what it might look like? And how does today compare to what you guys thought it might be? Yeah, I, you know, that's a, that's a real good question. I, you won't believe the answer is I, I knew this thing was going to get big. 
I, I, I had a feeling. I, I talked to my friend Harold Kersner, who is the name in project management. I said, you want to be a part of this. You got to join the, the, the committee and get this, get your name in front. This is going to be a big thing. And he said, this is what he said to me. Lee said, I don't need no stinking credentials to prove that I'm a good project manager. Okay. That's what he said. Yeah. And he's still not a PMP, but he's the name guy for IIL. He's built the reputation. So he's proof that you don't have to be certified to be successful. But I could see it coming. I could feel it. Uh, I could see the growth in project management was just on the cusp of breaking loose. And so I, I anticipated. I, I got to tell you, back when I was doing a lot of training, I don't do a lot of that now, but it, I, I built a career on it. We created a little cottage industry called uh, PDUs uh, that uh, morphed into some real opportunities for some people to not only stay active in the in the business of project management, but turn some revenue on the way. Yeah, we had uh, Dr. Kirsner on the show, I don't know, maybe a year, year and a half ago. And we had him paired with Belinda Goodrich, whose organization teaches PMP, right? So it was a good pairing of a PMP and a, and a non-PMP. But the, but the point for both of them really was around education and business value, right? And that's what Dr. Kersner talked about was he brought up his IBM stories and, and all of that. Um, so great to hear you mention him as well. As well. I bet the, he didn't mention my story, did he? He did not bring you up, Lee. Um, <laughs> I, I'll go back and re-listen to the episode. And I suggest yeah, everybody go back and listen didn't. to the episode. But I don't remember it coming up. <laughs> uh, we'll see. Uh, and today, just uh, you mentioned IIL. I'll just throw it out there. They're having um, – today is the launch of their Agile online conference. So everybody should go uh, out there. Yep. Uh, if you're a veteran – or military spouse uh, through the relationship they have with uh, my organization, VPMMA. If you use special code during registration, VPMMA, your registration is free for that event. So thank you to IIL for providing that at no cost to our veterans. A uh, little plug for IIL and, and their upcoming conference. I appreciate that. Um, you know, Sierra, what is the future, right? We, we've, We've talked about the past. Lee has walked us through up to today. You've certainly carried us into the changes that are coming up next year. But what's the future look like for the PMP? What comes after 2021? That's a good question. Right now, um, once we release the new exam, we're so, we will start assessing, you know, types of questions that are needed, um, What are what's really been effective. I mean, as I said earlier, as I was looking back over the test, a lot of the questions kind of look similar in nature. How do we need to evolve that, if at all? Um, maybe maybe we don't need to do a lot there. Um, but I think that that's one of the things. One of the things, the other new things that we did this year that we're still trying to get right is bringing the PMP completely online. It was in response to the COVID-19 crisis where um, test centers were shutting down left, right, and center. And we really had to respond to the demand. I thought it was tremendously um, interesting that even though the world seemed to be in utter chaos, I still had my phone ringing off the hook of people who wanted to take the PMP but couldn't because of the circumstances and the test center closing. So we took a step out there and we delivered the started delivering PMP online. Um, but with that, you know, we got to think about some different things like how do you make this exam palatable for four hour experience on your in your house or so four and a half hours. Um, I think about how this exam has evolved and it was eight hours at the very beginning and now it's four and a half, but that's too long to be sitting in your house without breaks and things of that nature. So I think you, we're starting to look into that and I don't know what that means. I don't know if it means we're going to break it into small pieces to make it palatable. Um, I, I really hope the world gets back to normal and we can test in the test center, but I think it's wise for us to start thinking of what if this is the new normal and we have more things happening online, how do we create and design an experience that's really going to be um, manageable when you're at home on your own network, on your own device? And so that's something that my team is really tasked with. Um, some other improvements that are coming sooner than that, though, um, this month you'll see a rollout of our new certification application, um, which is streamlined and newly designed with predictive text, and um, it's just easier to use. I'm, I'm pretty proud of it. 
and we're going to be, be doing some iterations there to allow people who get audited. At some point, we'll be allowing things like uploading of your documents as opposed to just mailing things in. Again, responding to the realities that we all live in now, it's very few of us who are still mailing things around. We prefer to email and scan and things of that nature. And so we're really responding to that as well. But I think the biggest thing is really trying to make sure that we keep the sex um, current. We'll be beginning some new research probably next year to see how the changes we put in the market are landing, like how people are responding to that. And so we're always and forever going to be looking at it and challenging ourselves to continuously improve the test wherever we can. So it, it, you mentioned, right, we're, we are in a new world right now. We don't know how long we're going to be in this world, uh, uh -huh. but it's going to create new habits regardless, right? People are going to be doing work differently. Uh -huh. So what's the best way to prepare right, for the PMP going forward compared to how we used to do it? Well, I mean, there are some people who are still, you know, loving face-to-face -face training. There's lots of value in that. And, and if your jurisdiction allows for that kind of um, training, great, hats off to you. I'm really encouraged by a lot of the stuff I'm seeing where there are traditional brick-and-mortar face-to-face training is now being delivered virtually using something like Zoom or something else. They still can train as many people as they want and and they're recreating or redesigning their exercises to make them appropriate um, over an internet connection. And I think there's a lot of value to that. Um, but also as more people are like stretching into what they call the gig economy, where they don't have a traditional nine to five. And really when they're taking off to go to this training class, either sitting for hours at home in a virtual training class or traveling to a location and taking training, they're not getting paid because um, they're a gig economist, they're consultants or what have you. So I think there is still also a place for people, particularly in this time and age, to look at things like self-paced offering. And I think choice is clear. Like you need to give people choices. They need to be able to have options so that they can obtain and reach their goals, like getting a PNP within the parameters that they set for themselves. They need the choice. And Lee, I guess, same question right back to you from not from the institution, but from a, a consulting organization that you run, but as well as just a practitioner out there. How, you know, how do you suggest people prepare as well? Well, I, you know, the, the thing that makes a difference is the word practitioner. I think we we need to get we need to expose this process to as many people as possible so that they can adopt it and use it and grow into the PMP. The, the beauty of it is we look at a million PMPs and people go, wow, that's a, that's a lot of PMPs. We've barely scratched the surface of that marketplace. We, I mean, yeah. we're just at, at the beginnings. And fortunately, the leadership of the organization uh, is trying to position us to where we can be available to provide what those people need uh, in the future. And I think I, I, I won't say who told me this, but I, I was told in a recent conversation that we could maybe have as many as 10 million PMPs in five years. I believe that if we position ourselves, if we make it easy for those people who are practitioners uh, to be able to adapt to the PMP, PMI philosophy, uh, I, I said, we've just, we've scratched, we've barely scratched the surface. I, I, by the time I'm gone and dust, there'll probably be 20 million PMPs. And I'm, I'm anxious to see it. We have, we have the leadership in the profession, not just in PMI, but in the profession that sees what the future is going to look like. And I think we're positioned to take advantage of that. You know, one thing I'm, I don't know, maybe concerns the right word, maybe it's not, but I think back to 2008, 2009, when we had the last recession in the U.S., I found too many candidates interviewing with the PMP that really shouldn't have had their PMP, but they were out of work, right? So they used that time wisely, went and got certified. And, and I'm wondering if, Sierra, maybe it's too early to see any uptick in this or any numbers on this, but it's not just the U.S., everybody in the world's being impacted by the pandemic, do you think we're going to see an uptick 
and the number of people getting certified just because, heck, you got 40 million people in the U.S. that are unemployed. A bunch of them are going to go get training and try to figure out what certification they can go get. You know, the honest to, to goodness truth is, you know, CMP is pretty valuable um, when you go and look for a job. In this economy with people having, those of us who are fortunate to continue to work and work from home, um, one of the jobs and professions that seems to be surviving is project management, right? And so if I was trying to reinvent myself, potentially I would look at this. One of the things that we've tried to do, at least in the last seven years since I've been there, is really look at the questions and make sure they reflect experience. Because there's always going to be that smart person who can study hard and go to a class and master stuff. But we try to balance the test content to show that if you didn't have experience, no matter how many times you read the pen box, you wouldn't get this question right. So we have a couple of those um, types of questions, not a couple, of a good percentage of questions like that in the PMP. And that's really to guard us against having the wrong person there. But my philosophy is people need to be able to reinvent themselves. People need to be able to enter the profession. And if there's someone who's a smart, I don't know, whatever, you know, retail person, a smart retail person out there, and they decided, you know what, this is not going to work for me in the new normal. I need a new career. And they study hard and they're able to translate their experience of working with people in a business environment, um, applying a process. And they can pass even those questions that talk about true practitioner experience. Why not have them get a PNP? Let them get a shot, right? And so I'm, I am of the same mindset of Lee that the test is really the gatekeeper. As um, long as we assure that that test is designed and developed with true practice in mind, if you can pass that test, then that means that even if you haven't practiced as much as you should have, that you probably are trainable, right? Give them a shot. Yeah. There's another issue that I think comes into play here, and I've been on some panels about this in some of the symposiums that I think there's a lot of responsibility that belongs to the hiring manager. You, you need to know the kinds of questions you can ask or should ask to find out. I mean, I've, I've interviewed a, a potential project manager and I started asking him about critical path schedule and he had no clue, but he had a PMP. Well, that's a, that's an eliminator done. You're gone. Uh, hiring managers need to be prepared to conduct interviews of potential project managers, whether they have a PMP or not. I, I will tell you, for one thing, I think hiring managers miss a lot of extremely good talent because they don't have a PMP. There's sure. a lot of really good project managers out there that haven't yet had the opportunity to become PMP credentials. Does that eliminate them from the job market? I would hope not. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, we look. Uh, you mentioned Harold Kersner, right? A good example. But yeah, I've got people on my team right now that uh, don't have PMP certification, and I'm glad they're on my team, right? I mean, they are sure. they're completely Absolutely. capable. You know, we're running short on time. We're getting close to the end, but I want to get one more question in before uh, we sign off. Um, you know, there's Prince Two and and other organizations out there in the world that provide an alternative to the PMI approach with PMP is, you know, kind of the thought process out there that the competition is good, it, it keeps us healthy and on our toes, or are we trying to squash the competition, right? What's the thought there? Is that question for me? I'll, whoever wants to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not touching it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think, you know, I believe in a, a, a competitive marketplace, right? It, it, it really inspires innovation, and it makes us really um, – focus in on providing something that is of value and beneficial to the markets we serve. So I think having competition is not a bad thing, but I, I, I like to think that the PMP stands above and beyond those because, again, we're really tailored to experience and practitioners. I look at Prince 1 and Prince 2, I'm sorry, <laughs> Prince 2, <laughs> and I, I see them as more of a beginner's test more of a CAPM, and I think people who have the, the credential might argue with me about that, but just based on my exposure to what um, and what's entailed. Um, but I think, again, like having competition is not a bad thing. It, it allows people to choose the product that's right for them that's going to meet their needs. 
choosing the PMP means you choose a global standard. You choose something that makes sure that your job skills and the competencies we're testing you on are universal, translatable to other industries, other geographies, and just applicable across the world. And so that's always going to give us like a one-up in that regard. But I, I'm not scared of competition. So no need to squash them. It makes it fun. <laughs> I love it. First of all, I want to thank both of you. I mean, for me, super informative to hear the stories, Lee, of how this all started and Sierra to get where we're going and where we're at today. I'm sure our listeners really benefited from this as well. It's nice to step back a little bit and reflect on what we're all doing and, and what the PMP means to the industry. So thank you both for your time today. How can people get in touch with you after the show if they want to follow up or do you have any upcoming engagements that you need to share with the audience? Uh, Sierra, we'll start with you. Well, if you'd like, you can find me on LinkedIn. That's probably the best place to find me. Um, Sierra Hampton Simmons, I'm there. Um, you can also write to me directly at PMI, which is Sierra.HamptonSimmons at PMI.org. I don't have any engagements because the world's kind of locked down right now, <laughs> but, <laughs> but maybe soon. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for joining us, Sierra. I appreciate it. And Lee, same for you. Yeah, I've changed my business model to basically doing webinars now. I, I can reach out and touch massive numbers of people without ever leaving home. And uh, the feedback I've gotten is said that's really it's appreciated. It's something that uh, people find useful. So I'm doing uh, right now, I'm on a gig to do about 50 uh, international PMI chapters in the next month. I've done 10 already this month and uh, about 2,000 attendees. And I, I just, I leave it open. I, I they, they've got my LinkedIn connection, follow up with questions. Uh, I'm really, I'm kind of here for the profession. My, my, I'm driving my wife crazy because that's all <laughs> I do anymore. And so she's getting a little bit upset with it. But, you know, after 53 years, she'll get over it. <laughs> well, thank you both uh, for joining me, right? Uh, again, this has uh, been an honor for me to, I'm PMP certified. I'm a PMI member. I renew every three years. It's important to me. It's important to our industry. And uh, I recall uh, Jim Snyder had come out and talked to the Phoenix chapter a couple of years back and really gave a, a walk through time with PMI as a whole. And that was such a great session that he led that I to have that opportunity to do that with the PMP. Really appreciate that. So thank you, both of you. Obviously, thank you to our listeners as well. We don't exist if people don't tune in. So thank you so much for listening uh, and also the downloads of our podcast. Be sure to visit projectmanagementofficehours.com to see all of our great content and our guests that we have upcoming. We've got a full range. We've got Agile with Jesse Fuel coming up next. Cornelius Fickner with PMP, staying on topic. We've got him coming up after that. Chris Kopp from Corporate America will be joining us talking about performance reviews. So we've uh, we've got a wide range of topics upcoming. Also a reminder, again, we record these shows, right? So they're available as a podcast. Be sure to review, rate, and listen, download on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Spreaker, whatever your podcast platform of choice is. And of course, thank you to our sponsors, the PMO Squad. Visit pmosquad.com to learn more about the Purpose Driven PMO and all of their project management services. So that's it for now. Office hours are closed. Until next time, I'm PMO Joe, and you've been listening to Project Management Office Hours. Mm -hmm.